Today I'm going to explain how you can achieve the best results with the video mode of your iPhone 15, 15 Pro and Pro Max. To do this, we'll take a detailed look at the features of the app and also take a close look at the settings. In doing so, I will explain the 20 most important video features of your iPhone. Please note, there is not the one setting that is ideal for all situations. And this also applies to ProRes or Lock. It's more about mastering all the important features so that you can optimally adapt the recording settings to the situation. Your your iPhone actually has four video modes, video, cinematic, slow-mo and time-lapse. The main difference between the video and the cinematic mode is that the cinematic mode artificially creates a blurred background, as if the shot was taken with a professional camera and a good lens. But let's start simple, with the interface in standard video mode. The white lines represent the grid, they are there to help you compose your shot. In filmmaking, as in photography, applying the rule of thirds often leads to more interesting results. This means that depending on the situation, your subject should not be placed exactly in the middle, but rather on the left or right line. You can deactivate the grid in the settings if you wish. The white line in the middle should help you to keep your iPhone straight when recording. It appears as soon as you turn your iPhone to the side. When the line turns yellow, you can be sure that the horizon is straight. Especially when shooting video, it is important to set the framing correctly. Corrections made in post will lead to a visible reduction in image quality. That's why it's also important to choose the right lens for the shot. And the choice of lens is not just about zooming in and out. The different cameras don't just create a different look, they have different focal lengths and therefore lead to different levels of distortion. The spatial depth in the image is represented very differently. The wider the lens, the more distortions there will be. This usually has a negative effect on close-ups of faces. For such cases, you should therefore use the camera with the highest possible focal length. On the iPhone 15, this would be the main camera, so the camera you activate with the zoom factor of 1. On the 15 Pro or Pro Max, the camera with the telephoto lens, and thus the camera you activate with the zoom factor of 3 or 5. On the other hand, the ultra-wide lens, so the camera with the 0.5, is of course suitable for spectacular landscape shots or the depiction of spatial depth. There is also a zoom factor of 2. However, this is not an additional lens, but rather a crop of the main camera. This is possible without much loss of quality, because the main camera has a high resolution sensor with 48 megapixels. Nevertheless, the image quality is a bit worse with this zoom factor. You should therefore avoid it if you want to achieve the absolute best image quality. What you should definitely avoid in video mode is a zoom factor between the lenses. For example, between 0.5 and 1, or between 2 and 5. So don't just zoom in and out with your fingers. And don't use the zoom wheel, which opens when you tap and hold the lens numbers. This leads to a clear reduction in image quality. Apart from that, the different cameras have different sensors and different apertures. No matter if you use the iPhone 15 or 15 Pro or Pro Max, in all cases, in low light conditions, you will get the best results with the main camera. It has the largest sensor and the largest aperture. In the evening or indoors, you should therefore use the main camera, that is the camera with the zoom factor of 1, for optimal results. The choice of the lens also affects the stabilization of your video. Normally, the wider the focal length of the lens, the more stable a video will look. The ultra-wide lens would therefore normally have advantages over the other two lenses of your iPhone. However, the main camera features an excellent optical image stabilization. The shots of the ultra-wide camera are only stabilized electronically. For this reason, the recordings of the main camera look almost as stable as those of the ultra-wide camera. But you should not use the telephoto lens when moving. In connection with the stabilization, the iPhone 15 and 15 Pro have a particularly cool feature, the action mode. The action mode leads to a significantly improved electronic stabilization of the shot, similar to a GoPro. You activate the action mode by tapping on the little icon with the running man. If it is yellow, then the action mode is activated. Now your iPhone will stabilize recordings with movement much better. However, you should only activate the action mode if you really need it, because it has decisive disadvantages. It leads to a strong crop of the image. This means that the field of view becomes significantly smaller. And not only that, the image quality also suffers heavily under the action mode. The maximum resolution is now limited to 2.8K. For optimal image quality, you should therefore avoid using the action mode. And of course, also fast movements during the recording. The action mode is not only helpful in connection with action, it can also help you, for example, to achieve a smooth camera movement with the telephoto lens. 
and one of the lenses of the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max has a very special capability. The ultra-wide lens is able to focus on extremely close objects. This way you can depict very small objects very large. Apple calls this macro mode. And with the macro mode you can also take interesting shots in video mode. It doesn't really matter which camera is active. If you get very close to an object before you start recording, your iPhone will automatically activate the macro mode and switch to the ultra-wide lens. You will notice this by the strange image jumps. However, if you have already started recording with the main camera or the telephoto lens, then the automatic camera switch will not happen. The macro mode is deactivated and you can no longer focus close. If you don't like the way the iPhone automatically switches cameras to activate the macro mode, you can activate the macro control feature in the settings of the camera app. Now, whenever the macro mode is automatically activated, a yellow icon with a flower appears. When you tap on it, you disable the macro mode and your iPhone's camera will no longer automatically switch lenses when you approach an object. Correct exposure and focus are also crucial for optimal image quality, especially if you use the main camera or the telephoto lens certain parts of the image may be in focus and others not. This is especially the case when there are objects in the near foreground. Your iPhone will always set the focus automatically and it does this very well. However, you may not be happy with the automatic focus and want to adjust it manually. You can do this easily by tapping on the object you want to be in focus. The exposure will then also adjust to the new focus area. But if you then move the camera, the focus and exposure will change again automatically. When shooting videos, you may want to perform certain camera movements and prevent the focus and exposure from changing automatically. This simply doesn't look professional. You should therefore fix focus and exposure as often as possible. You can do this by tapping and holding on the object you want to have in focus. The AEAF lock icon appears at the top of the screen. The exposure and focus will now not change even if you move the iPhone. If you are still not happy with the exposure, you can adjust it using the sun icon next to the yellow square. If you swipe the sun up, the image will get brighter. If you swipe it down, it will get darker. This works when focus and exposure are locked, as well as when the automatic is active. However, when a new focus point is set, your adjustments are cancelled. When shooting video, it can be useful to constantly overexpose or underexpose your image slightly, regardless of whether the focus changes or not. Remember that correct exposure is more important when shooting video than when shooting stills, especially because the frames of a video file don't contain as much information as individual photos and therefore can't be edited as well. If you swipe your finger slightly upwards, free new icons appear. On the left there is the flash, on the right the icon for the action mode and in the middle there is the symbol for the exposure compensation control. If you tap on it, a slider will appear with which you can adjust the exposure. If you adjust the exposure in this way, the negative or positive value is retained and all further shots will be underexposed or overexposed. But why should you even deviate from the automatic exposure? The fact is that the automatic exposure of the iPhone works incredibly well and highlights, that is very bright areas in the image, are also very well protected by the extremely high dynamic range. Exposure control on the iPhone is therefore less about preventing burned out highlights and more about creative control. In other words, what mood do you want to convey and should the image therefore be a little brighter or darker? Overall, the iPhone tends to expose the entire image a bit too brightly. For a more cinematic look, you should therefore constantly underexpose your shots and choose a slightly negative value here. The two settings here in the upper right corner are very important. The settings for resolution and frame rate. As far as the resolution is concerned, you have the choice between HD, that is 1080, and 4K. Since today, as I said, we are talking about how you can achieve the best possible video quality with your iPhone, you should choose 4K here. This leads to a few advantages and disadvantages. The image has a much higher resolution than an HD image. It therefore looks much better especially on larger screens. You can also crop in and adjust the framing in post without this immediately leading to a significant drop in image quality. The disadvantage of 4K is clear. The higher resolution requires significantly more storage space. On the right, you can set the frame rate. In 4K, 24, 30 and 60 frames per second are available. Basically, the more frames per second, the smoother and perhaps more natural your footage will look. However, professional movies are generally shot at 24 frames per second. Our eyes have long since become accustomed to this low frame rate. Therefore, a video shot at 24 frames per second looks more cinematic than one shot at 30 or 60 frames per second. However, especially if there is a lot of movement in the image, 24 frames per second can look a bit jerky and choppy. If that bothers you and you prefer a more fluid look, then you should choose 30 frames 
per second. I would only choose 60 frames per second if you want to capture slow motion shots. You can slow down a shot taken with 60 frames per second to 40% in post and get some really cool slow motion shots in 4K. On the other hand, if you don't need slow motion, I wouldn't use 4K 60. The higher frame rate not only requires more storage space, it is also disadvantage in low light conditions, as less light can be captured for each frame. Especially in low light, you will therefore achieve better results with 24 or 30 frames per second. And while we were on the subject of cinematic shots, let's take a closer look at the cinematic video mode. As already mentioned at the beginning, this is a kind of portrait mode for video. This means that the iPhone artificially creates a blurred background. Since this blur effect is actually used all the time in professional movies, we perceive it as very cinematic. And because the iPhone creates an artificial blur, you can tap on a subject to decide what should be sharp, that is, in focus. A yellow rounded bar appears. If it is a person or something else that is moving, you can activate tracking with another tap. The bar changes and the AF tracking lock message appears. The iPhone will now try to keep the subject in focus, even if it is moving. If you want to lock the focus on a certain spot, you do this as in normal video mode by tapping and holding on the spot. Now, the focus remains on this spot, regardless of whether subjects are moving in the image. In cinematic mode, you can use the main camera and on the iPhone 15 Pro the camera with the telephoto lens. Unfortunately, on the iPhone 15 Pro Max, the telephoto lens is not available, only the two times zoom factor. Apart from the flash and the exposure compensation control, you can also set the f-stop. Similar to a professional camera with the f-stop, you can adjust the intensity of the effect. The following applies. The smaller the value, the stronger the effect, and the higher the value, the smaller the amount of blur. You can also see the set value in the top right corner. The cinematic mode is a cool feature, however, it is still not fully perfected. There are often imperfections at the edges. In slow-mo mode, as the name suggests, you can shoot slow motion videos. To do this, your iPhone shoots a video at 120 or 240 frames per second. At the moment, this is only possible in HD. Basically, you should only use this mode if you really need it. The reduced resolution and the high number of frames per second lead to a considerable decrease in image quality. Especially shots with 240 frames per second really don't look good. Sometimes, however, it is fun to shoot such a slow motion video and if there is a lot of action, it can lead to interesting results. I recommend that in such cases, you get as close as possible to the action. You want your subject to be as big as possible. This is the best way to hide the poor image quality. The time-lapse mode is also an interesting feature. You can use it to convey the passage of time very well and, for example, enhance your travel videos. Unfortunately, apart from the exposure compensation control, there are no settings that you could change. I would just like to add that you can also move around with the iPhone in good lighting conditions. Hold it steady and at a constant height and move towards or around an object in predefined lines, for example. The iPhone will stabilize the shot afterwards and interesting hyperlapses will result. In low light conditions, however, you should use the iPhone on a tripod. If you are interested in what tripods are available and what my favorite iPhone accessories are for filmmaking, check out the links in the video description. It's time to take a look at the settings of the camera app. Here you can change some very important settings. Let's take a look at the format first. Here you can choose between high efficiency and most compatible. If you choose high efficiency, your iPhone will capture videos in the HEVC codec. This codec can compress the video files much more effectively. This means that the file sizes will be smaller and I mean significantly smaller. But some older devices have problems with this codec. The important question now is whether the choice also has an impact on the image quality. With earlier iPhones, the high efficiency mode sometimes led to worse results. According to Apple, there is no loss of image quality. I have compared a few shots here, and as you can see, there is hardly any difference between the HEVC shot and the shot taken with most compatible, which is the old codec. Basically, I would recommend using the high efficiency mode. This is necessary anyway if you want to shoot in 4K60, 1080-240, in cinematic mode or videos in HDR. And that brings us to the next important topic, HDR and the question of whether you should capture your videos in HDR and Dolby Vision. You can switch the HDR mode on and off in the record video menu. I have already made a very detailed video on this topic. Today I will explain the topic of HDR in a roughly simplified way. With HDR, your iPhone can capture and display video clips 
that they have significantly higher brightness values than a normal video clip. This means that the very bright areas in the image, for example light sources, can be displayed much brighter than with a normal video. The difference is huge. This makes the footage look much more realistic and natural. It has much more contrast, because the difference between very dark and very bright is much bigger. In addition, your iPhone uses a 10-bit color depth for HDR recordings. So there are many more color gradations between dark and bright. All this, of course, allows for a much better image quality. However, there is a crucial catch. You need an HDR screen to display the footage correctly and with these special characteristics. In addition, you also have to create an HDR project in video editing and should use an HDR monitor for this. Of course, the iPhone itself has an HDR and Dolby Vision capable screen. Therefore, HDR videos on the iPhone look much better than non-HDR videos. However, if you transfer your videos to your computer to view them on your monitor, or to use them for a bigger project, it's a different story. The video clip is automatically adjusted during playback and differences are only noticeable if your screen supports high brightness values. In video editing, the HDR shot may look completely overexposed and you will have to convert it to a normal looking video. As I said, the subject is complex. If you are interested, watch my related video. Today, to summarize, I would like to say that you should definitely use HDR if you watch your videos mainly on your iPhone. If on the other hand, you are shooting your videos to create a larger project on your PC, then there is no real advantage to shooting the video in HDR. The next very interesting topic is ProRes. Under Formats, you can enable Apple ProRes on the iPhone 15 Pro and Pro Max. As we have already seen, the iPhone can take high resolution videos in 4K. This can potentially lead to very large files. To save storage space, all video files are therefore highly compressed. Of course, information is lost in the process and artifacts can also occur. This compression can also slow down the editing process of the video if your computer doesn't have enough power. With ProRes, Apple has developed its own codec that is particularly well suited for video editing. ProRes therefore has advantages when you edit your videos and also offers better image quality because the video files are much less compressed. The disadvantage is obvious. The video files are bigger and I mean a lot bigger, about 20 times as big. And at first glance, as you can see here, there is hardly any difference in image quality. So use ProRes only for the best possible image quality in very special situations. But keep in mind that you also have to transfer and store your footage. If you activate ProRes, you have the choice between HDR, SDR and Lock. I've just explained HDR and SDR stands for Standard Dynamic Range which is basically the standard non-HDR video mode. And lock is probably the most misunderstood feature when it comes to video recording. For many, you should always shoot in lock to get the best possible image quality. However, this is not always true. To understand why, we need to take a quick look at what the lock setting actually does. Let's take a look at this scene. It contains very dark areas, for example my t-shirt, and very bright areas, for example the window. Normally, very dark areas of a scene will be displayed very dark in a shot, and very bright areas will of course be displayed very bright. This can be represented on an axis. Don't worry, this is not about math. I'll try to explain it to you as simply as possible. The further to the left a point is on this axis, the darker it is in the scene. So the t-shirt would be here and the window would be on the far right. For example here. And now we are going to reproduce the two points in a video recording. The following applies. The higher a point is, the brighter it is shown in the recording. So the t-shirt is on the left because it is very dark and at the bottom because it is also depicted very dark. The window is on the far right because it is very bright and at the top because it should also be displayed very brightly. The result is a line like this. Earlier I said that an HDR screen can display very bright areas in the image much brighter than a normal screen. A normal screen can only display a very limited dynamic range. The range between very dark and very bright is very limited. The dynamic range of a normal screen ends at this line for example. Everything that is brighter is only displayed in white and no longer contains any details. Our window becomes a white spot. Of course we want to prevent this. In a normal shot, areas in the scene that are twice as bright are also displayed twice as bright. And this is why such a straight line appears in my graphic. A lock curve changes this ratio. Brighter areas in the scene are no longer displayed quite as brightly. So areas that are twice as bright are no longer displayed twice as bright. Instead of a line, such a curve is created. In this way, it is possible to preserve the details of the very bright areas in the image and there are fewer burnt out areas. 
Brighter areas can now be displayed by the screen. A side effect of this process is that the image now has much less contrast and looks very flat. You need to edit it at contrast and saturation to get in simple terms a normal looking clip. But you can't just add contrast and saturation because the lock profile also affects the colors. You should use the LUTs provided by Apple for Apple Lock for the conversion. Otherwise, colors could be displayed incorrectly. What's cool is that the conversion in Final Cut Pro is now done automatically, similar to HDR. I have explained lock in more detail to help you understand the following. Lock is normally only needed if the scene has very bright and very dark areas at the same time. For night shots, for example, lock doesn't really have any advantages. Lock also has disadvantages. It can potentially lead to more image noise and every shot has to be edited. Lock files are not bigger, so more brightness levels are squeezed into the same container. In addition, in standard mode, the iPhone probably overlays several exposures and achieves an excellent dynamic range. As you can see here, the dynamic range of the standard shot is therefore sometimes even visibly better than that of the lock recording. Nevertheless, I am a fan of Apple Lock. The shot looks much softer and has less digital sharpness than an SDR or HDR shot. And of course, the lower contrast and saturation make the shot well suited for color grading. In summary, I recommend that you use HDR if you want to watch your videos on an HDR capable display and use lock for softer, more cinematic shots and especially for color grading. Okay, I hope that wasn't too detailed. Let's take a look at the remaining settings in the record video menu. Right at the beginning, you can set your default frame rate at which the video mode will start. If you live in the PAL region, which would be most states outside the US and Canada, you can activate the PAL frame rates here. This would be 25 frames per second instead of 24. This will reduce flickering problems when shooting video in artificial light. As we saw before with the action mode, the electronic image stabilization leads to a crop and a smaller field of view. As you already know, the iPhone electronically stable stabilizes recordings in the video and cinematic mode, even without using the action mode, although not as heavily. Here you can reduce the stabilization. Your shots will then look a bit shakier. However, the field of view is enlarged. You should therefore mainly deactivate the feature when you use your iPhone on a tripod or a gimbal. The action mode leads to significantly improved electronic image stabilization. However, it also leads to a particularly strong crop and a reduced resolution. In addition, the electronic image stabilization requires particularly fast shutter speeds to work well, but all of this is of great disadvantage in low light conditions and results in poorer image quality. If you activate action mode lower light, you reduce the performance of the image stabilization in action mode. In return, you get a better image quality. However, you should mainly use this feature in low light conditions. In low light conditions, low frame rates like 24 or 25 frames per second are advantages. Your iPhone has a feature called Auto FPS that will automatically reduce a higher frame rate of 30 or 60 FPS to 24 frames per second in low light. Here you can specify whether the feature should only be active at 30 FPS or also at 60 frames per second. If you want to be sure that the video is always captured at the frame rate you set, you should switch off the feature. If you enable lock camera, the iPhone will no longer automatically switch cameras when you zoom in or out while recording, so you can only zoom digitally. This can be useful because as I said, the different cameras have different properties. Properties. It can therefore look strange if the iPhone changes the lens during the recording. And especially when taking long shots, it can happen that your iPhone changes the white balance for no apparent reason. This doesn't look good and looks unprofessional. To prevent this, you can specify here that the white balance should not be changed during the recording. And that's it for today. If you want to know how to get the best results in photo mode, check out my tutorial on the photo mode of the iPhone 15 and 15 Pro and Pro Max. Or learn the best camera tricks for your iPhone. There is also a video about that on my channel. If you found this video interesting, give me a like as feedback. There will be more iPhone tutorials to come. So stay tuned and see you next time.